ASEAN Dailies. First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning. Welcome to Korean ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. You are with Grace um, at ASEAN Dailies, where we deliver news from Southeast Asia. Let's start with um, news and also discuss about how Russia has been using Korean, especially North Koreans, as slaves um, for their um, labor uh, work. And apparently, according to North Korea, it says that it's facing its worst drought in the century, and also United Nations uh, has warned uh, of the the danger of mass starvation. North Korea is pretty well known for having, uh, I will say, unfair treatment towards the citizens of North Korea, as well as how government has been uh, sort of making use of the people there, uh, and also to um, well. According to them, it is a reason to boost up the economic growth. So basically, tens of thousands of these North Korean uh, laborers now, they work in Russia. And many of them are in the construction industry. And it is in the in the remote for the east of the country. But however, here the question is to fund a nuclear program in the, uh, North Korea. The president, Kim Jong-un, is sending their uh, slave na- laborers. I mean, of course, they are North Koreans to, um, to, to countries around the world, and including Russia, of course. And these slaves are um, worth almost $2 billion. So over about uh, 90,000 North Koreans are in other countries. Uh, Mongolia uh, forces North Koreans uh, to work in dangerous mines as well. Chinese employs the people in numerous textile factories. However, it is Russia who uh, reigns supreme. Over 25,000 North Koreans work in the neighboring countries. In fact, just the other day, um, the BBC uh, released a video of, um, of visiting uh, North Koreans in Russia. And then the security was very, very, uh, very strict. And also all of them were questioning um, and uh, why uh, they're there with the cameras and all those equipments to record the sites. And some of the sites they couldn't uh, record it. However, overall, the conditions and the treatment they were getting was very filthy and very unfair. However, not of not of um, North Koreans have made any complaints regarding this uh, um, conditions or even the treatment they are getting. And uh, to them, uh, money is not the issues. It's just uh, how they can serve their own countries by uh, being sent to the other country. And Kim Jong-un shipped out even more due to the uh, food shortage caused by the drought. Well, according to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, it, it is said that it is because of the uh, drought that, that they have been sending um, the North Koreans to Russia. However, is it really the cause of it? And um, in 2011, when Kim Jong-il still ruled North Korea, uh, the vices as Shane Smith heard about the slave camps from a freelance journalist, Simon uh, Ostrovsky, and that they actually t- uh, took a few film crew to the camps to interview the Russians as well as North Koreans. Well, it is not so surprising to know how many population or what's the population out there uh, in other countries. But what's surprising here part is North Koreans there in other countries, they really do not mind staying there with this really... Um, beyond the condition that you can think of and it is mo- almost the worst condition that people or human beings can live of even the any medical services or even the hygienic matter it's really unseen there so this I mean, this discussion and this, well, news need to be spread uh, even more just to make sure that people are aware of it. And perhaps it is also need to be stopped to use um, certain uh, populations as slave laborers in certain countries. Um, well, it is also agreed by the leader of North Korea, I mean, to, to boost up their economic growth. However, it is really a fair treatment to send out all these people. I mean, just just because of the f- a food shortage and also drought, the weather condition.
So the question is still remained and it is something that we all need to think about. Well, well, it is Monday and well, a lot of people might have, um, Monday blues, <laughs> uh, waking up in the morning and then to start the day. However, um, let's go for, uh, sort of different news on the, on the Nepal side. And apparently, uh, Nepal's most popular trekking region has been declared, uh, safe by the government commission report. And that was followed by the earthquakes in April and May and that killed more than 9,000 people. But do you all believe this, um, um, the report, uh, by, it, it is released, especially after the earthquake, or is it sort of the cover up report by a news agency or the organization? The question is, the report is flawed, and uh, this is because it was rushed and also made on the basis of only one week filled work, which is not enough. And this particular uh, site, if you have been there, uh, as much as it is very well known for hikers and also uh, mountain, mountain trackers to visit, and it is one of their historical moments when they visit there, however, it is also uh, noticeable the amount of people who were killed because of these tracking courses there. So Nepal uh, Mounti- uh, Mountaineering Association uh, President Ansharing Sharpa, according to him, he said, because the reports commissioned by the Dark government were based on about one week of field work, they were totally insufficient. As well as uh, Nepal uh, Tracking Asian Association uh, Ra- uh, President Ramesh Damala, uh, he mentioned that operators would not send clients to either region on the basis of two reports. So such assessments need to have the involvement of stakeholders, uh, like them to have the credibility. And it is very important to, in fact, build up the credibility when it comes to a certain uh, area, especially the famous um, mountain tracking and also for hikers there. Well, let's go to Thailand this time. Apparently, Thailand is just getting tougher, on, especially on the youth drinking there. And uh, the Thai government has issued these tough nationwide restrictions on illegal street racing and also the sales of alcohol near educational institutions as a part of the uh, crackdown on youth drinking. Of course, the population and also the percentage on Youth drinking has been increasing quite dramatically for the past few years. So these new rules are, f- are fueling anxiety among Bangkok's restaurants as well as the bar owners. On this is talking about the business side, but then politically, um, they also want to prevent um, uh, youngsters from drinking and overdosing of all those alcohols. And but. All these restaurants and business uh, slots, they fear the restriction will devastate entertainment areas that make the capital a tourist magnet and also big money spinner as well. Well, according to a certain agency, it is of course not a mention uh, that uh, regarding the, the boundary of these prohibited zones. But the order, um, which takes immediate effect soon, also threatens to revoke a bar or club's operating license if it sells alcohol to a minor under the age of 20 or if it sells alcohol beyond these licensed hours. And so this particular order does not specify what near means with regards to the sales of alcohol near school, but this legislative changes expected to be in force uh, in the coming weeks will specifically ban the sales of alcohol within 300 meters of public and private universities, colleges, vocational institutes, but exempts the licensed hotels as well as the designated uh, entertainment district like uh, Peng Pong and as Royal City Avenue in Bangkok. So there are lots of mixed feedback that's been received uh, by public as well as the business owners out there. But no matter what, um, in well, in the Th- in Thailand, the nation itself. Um, 
It looks like this order will be implemented very, very soon. And in fact, according to a World Health Organization report published last year, 70.3% of Thais abstain from alcohol. Yet, the average amount of pure alcohol drunk by each Thai aged about 15 and older stands at 7.1 liters between 2008 and 2010. So this is double the average figure for Southeast Asia. So drink driving is really dangerous and, and it's endemic and contributing to the, the carnage on the roads during the major holiday periods. So um, implementing this law pretty soon, but at the same time, public also need to be educated in the proper way. As much as it's pretty worrisome among the business owners out there, especially um, the happening uh, a district in Thailand. However, perhaps it is time for them to think about why this law was implemented from the first place. So we'll take a short break. When we come back, uh, we'll deliver and also discuss news on the uh, political aspect of Southeast Asia. So stay tuned. ASEAN Dailies First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN. You are with Grace on ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news from Southeast Asia. We just had a, a bit of a breaking news uh, before this session. Now we are continuing with the political aspect of Southeast Asia. But let's stay here in the Malaysia for a while. And uh, we've got a few controversials. Um, I mean, controversial issues that's been going on for quite some time. And this issue uh, has been going on and it had threatened a lot of media agency um, studying from the Wall Street Journal, The Edge, as well as um, the Sarah Report. And in fact, coming back to The Edge, uh, the collective of groups representing the media professions are holding a series of activities, and, and that is to express their solidarity for The Edge Weekly, as well as The Edge Financial Daily, uh, following the Home Ministry three-month suspension order on the two publications. So that that includes a solidarity gathering at the edges office in Mutiara Damansara, which was just uh, last week and followed by the major rally that will be held on August 8th with the participation um, of the public and the civil society. And, well, of course, the location will be finalized as soon as possible. But this collective has also asked for all media members to stand in solidarity by registering. Uh, there is a hashtag, apparently, a hashtag at the edge during press conferences instead of their names, which was the uh, Detect line to be used for ongoing campaigns. So after this, uh, I mean, this controversial issue is just getting hotter and hotter. And not only in Malaysia, but then all the surrounding countries, even going to Europe and the USA, are aware of this particular news. And this particular solid, solid, uh, solidarity movement comprised the members of uh, Jaraka Media Maha. Well, and the Institute of Journalists, uh, Reporter Sand Frontiers, Center for Independent Journalism, as well as the Foreign Correspondent, the Club of Malaysia. So according to them, we take the stand that there are existing legal resources to be pursued by any dispute over this report. And also, um, without resorting uh, to an end, uh, our archaic law, which has long been abused to clamp down on the media. So there may be a sort of ethical uh, debate uh, surrounding for sure, but the edge media group's uh, method of uh, uh, obtaining information, which led to an expose on operation of uh, the state investment uh, arm, which is 1MDB. But this is not merit the government suspensions orders. So this whole group uh, urged all these media organizations, regardless of their language or stream, to stand its independently against the government's latest crackdown under the Printing Prices Publication Act 1984. So quite important. So be aware. And then um, there will be... Um, 
a rally going on set on the August 8th. So look out for that as well. And let's move on to um, Thailand this time. And apparently uh, Thailand uh, indicts about 72 people over human trafficking. But when it comes to human trafficking, it's very, very uh, long-term issues in Southeast Asia. Not only um, the from uh, Thailand, but also from Myanmar as well. But Thai prosecutors have indicted about 72 people that it's mentioned just before, uh, before, and including politicians and the army general over the trafficking of migrants from Myanmar and also Bangladesh. This arrest warrant have been issued for more than 30 others, and the attorney general office said. The investigation follows uh, the discovery of mass graves and it believed to contain the bodies of refugees and in the jungle camps nearby by the Thai-Malaysian border in May. And these suspects uh, face charges including uh, this human trafficking uh, part ca- uh, part packaging uh, uh, in the um, transactional crime network and it was bringing uh, sort of aliens to the uh, kingdom uh, illegally as well. And this most of those people who are indicted uh, from Thailand, but sev- uh, several Myanmar and Bangladeshi uh, citizens are also being held as well. And when it comes to human traffickers, it is very serious news. And in, in fact, Indonesia, um, the government has taken already, f- already a few steps of very, very strict laws and restrictions when it comes to human trafficking. However, a um, lot of people from these countries, they are flown uh, and reside majorly in the Malaysia. And in fact, Thai authorities, they faced international pressure earlier this year to crack down down on these smugglers after the images of thousands of migrants from Bangladeshi and also Myanmar stranded at sea were shared around the world. And this also was found, which is mass graves were discovered in an abandoned camp in the uh, southern province of uh, Songkhya in May, which is very troublesome. Um, and as, as well, it's very disturbing uh, by just by uh, looking at the images of all those graves. But where is the helping hand? And in fact, Thailand and Malaysia are desired destinations that I mentioned before for members of Myanmar's Rohingya Muslim minority and economic migrants from neighboring Bangladesh as well. So there will be uh, there are already lots of news regarding this but we really need to come up with a mechanism or policies to be able to I wouldn't say stop, but the lessen it. I mean something has to be stopped from somewhere and if we can't stop uh, human trafficking, but at least do something to to uh, make make the laws stricter or have some kind of policies otherwise there will be more graves and a more community uh, w- w- which w- which will just suffer uh, from being left out from each country in Southeast Asia. And lastly, before we end this political uh, news, let's talk about Cambodia. And apparently Cambodia um, a Senate, he says, okay, on the controversial NGO law. And apparently the Senate passed this law to regulate the country's non-profit sector as hundreds of people protested, in fact. And um, of course, the opponent said the law marks a deliber- deliberate effort by government to clamp down on the groups that have been criticizing the ruling party on the array of issues. So Cambodia's Senate approved this controversial law and in just a few hours, and despite the boycott by the senators from the opposition the Cambodian National Rescue Party, which is called also called CNRP. And uh, among the, of course, them were monks, angel workers, victims of land uh, grabbing who came to protest all these vague provisions when they said to, I mean, they say give the government the power to close any non-profit, non-profit or association it does not like. And where is the government response to this? The government said that the law is necessary to prevent terrorism and also money laundering and insists that people should not fear its uh, provisions. 
and the protesters do not believe those reassurances for sure. And the most concerning is that everyone. Whether you start a football team or whether even you start German classes, whether you want to talk about the Latin communities, they will be forced to register first. And those who are registered already, like um, uh, um, perhaps the other NGOs, if people violate Cambodia's dignity or morality, they will be suspended and deregistered or closed down, which is very, very strict. And there are also criticism that have been received internationally, the EU, European um, Union and also uh, United Nations and United States. All the key development partners, they have spoken out against this particular law and hundreds of non-profit who want it scrapped. Uh, but it's not only about the next two elections, but it's also about the, the trend the government has and, and regionally to stop civil society from expressing concerns and raising issues in the public arena. And it is very much in the Cambodia about the NGO serving the government, doing the work of the government, but eliminating and stopping all this and also even sanctioning those uh, who express, con- express concerns. It is worrisome and, and the Cambodia hope that they do the right thing really literally and this, uh, LNGO will be sent to Cambodia's king for his ascent which, uh, which is likely to happen in the coming few weeks. So we'll take a short break when we come back. This time we'll deliver and also discuss news on economical side of Southeast Asia. So stay- <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing here with Grace on ASEAN Dailies, where the, we deliver news from Southeast Asia. Let's travel to Indonesia this time. Apparently, um, not only the ringgit in Malaysia, but rupiah also hit 17 years low. And they have been playing down play uh, for the longest time. And... This weakening rupiah, which hit the fresh 70 year old against the dollar, um, the Indonesian authorities said it would not have the significant impact on Southeast Asia's largest economy. And in fact, the rupiah, the second worst performing Asian currency this year, after Malaysian ringgit, fell as much as 0.2% uh, last year and this ups and downs of rupiah are pretty normal and they will, this will not have a, such a big impact and this is according to uh, ship, uh, chef, chief uh, economic minister and the government with um, especially the central bank will try to safeguard the rupiah in accordance to the oldest fundamentals and central bank spokesman Peter uh, Jacob said that there was no uh, significant changes in the domestic foreign exchange market and also the cost of the weakening rupiah was due to external sentiment which we really need to perhaps dig Further, what are the external uh, sentiments that has been affecting in the dropping uh, of rupiah in, in Indonesia? And the dollar strengthened against the basket of um, these currencies. Uh, last week, after data showed the U.S. home resales hit about half a year high in June. And of course, the caution is growing, um, and this is over the possible uh, intervention by uh, Bank Indonesia to pop up. Prop up the rupiah, which is down more than 7% against the dollar so far this year. And the central bank deputy governor, uh, um, Mirza Ardi Swara, uh, mentioned that the central bank was always in the foreign exchange market, especially when the rupiah is undervalued. So hope that it will, well, this time it will, it will be the sort of last time for rupiah to hit sort of the lowest rate, but I hope it boost us up as soon as possible. And did you guys know the Starbucks? Um, I mean, Starbucks has the quite a good sales uh, for the past few years. And the global sales, in fact, increased 18% to $4.9 billion in the quarter uh, to 18th of June. And apparently that's the highest ever quarterly revenue. 
And among these uh, strongest and also the most remarkable quarters in our over 23 years as public company, and then this is from the the boss Howard Schultz, has described its third quarter performance uh, of Starbucks. And then the rise was mostly well thanks to by the um, especially the client and its previous Japanese partner Starbucks Japan and also new store openings as well. And this world's largest coffee chain opened about 431 new stores in the period. And I mean, as much as um, a lot more I mean, other uh, coffee chains have opened up, uh, Southeast Asia and around the world, still Starbucks is very well known and um, people, most of people do remember when it comes to coffee, they remember Starbucks. And in fact, if you, we talk about the total profit, the total net profit of Starbucks, it rose uh, from 22% to about $626.7 million. And the boss mentioned the sales did increase. This means it had served about 23 million more customers in the quarter compared to the same period uh, last year. And of those 80 million, in fact, they were from um, the U.S. And it is also said that uh, this loyalty uh, program had helped to drive its strong performance as well. The chain has worked with other firms such as writing sharing service and also music streaming uh, firm, which is one of the one of them is Spotify. So both uh, ride sharing service and also streaming firm services, they gave a chance to earn Starbucks starts, which also can be used in the coffee chain shops as well. So um, the shares also rose more than 3%. So it looks like Starbucks has been performing pretty well and receiving a lot of uh, good credibility and f- feedbacks from the clients. So keep it up Starbucks and the congratulations to your performance. Well, let's um, discuss on our uh, last news of economical news, which is on Philippines. Uh, Philippine President uh, Benigno Aquino drives his vehicles next to guess who? I mean, businessman James Zobel, um, and they ins- inspect the new MCX tollway, uh, which is a new expressway in the Munti- uh, Muntilupa, and this is Metro Manila in the Philippines. So. The Philippines country has been the, the magnet for foreign investment uh, over the past five years. And it also pushed its stock market to record high and lower the, the cost of the depth. However, the next years there will be change of governments uh, reintroducing an old risk. Um, I mean, political uncertainty. Well, since Aquino won the presidency in 2010 and promising its reform and a clean government, the Philippines uh, has outpaced its neighbors and has drawn money into the market. However, the election next year and also the global volatility already pushing the investors to seek safe havens and also the uncertainties over its successor. It could be a reason for its caution. But the presidents are limited by the law to a single six-year term and also Aquino final state of the nation address which was just last week will keep the succession issue prominent. The Philippines has over a long period of time and also has suffered from cycles of a better government and a poorer governance as well and this is according to the American Chamber of Commerce in Manila, John Forbes. And it is a cycle of the better governments right now, but it has not proven its ability to make the sustainable in the long run yet. So the risk is uh, pushed forward and and the risk is still there as the people do move forward into 2016. And... I mean, whoever takes over may not Im, uh, impart the same economic stability as this president. So hope, hopefully to receive more positive news. And also, Philippines, perhaps it's really, really time to step up and then strengthen the economic as well as the um, the whole society. Uh, and hopefully it brings all those, um, uh, the, the business and economic part as strong as 
I mean, um, stronger than this and to be able to contribute to ASEAN. So we'll take another short break and we'll be back with uh, this time our social culture part of Southeast Asia. So stay tuned. Uh. ASEAN Dailies. First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing your with grace on ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news and also discussing matters from Southeast Asia. Well, let's uh, bring up the, the whole environment, also the vibe here. Bringing up literally meat air meals. Have you heard of it? And it is having dinner in the sky, uh, sort of, in Kuala Lumpur. And that will be the first time in Southeast Asia and it will be held to have dining uh, in the mid-sky. Can you imagine? And on August 1st, dinner in the sky, that's the theme and also the name, will make its much anticipated debut in Malaysia. And it's, it's, it is ranked among the world's top 10 most unusual restaurants by the Forbes magazine, of course. And this got the unique experience and it is open to those age 18 and up and gives the whole new meaning to high class. I mean, I'll be talking about the, the price later on, but the wait stuff and the table in the air using the crane located right beside the KL Tower. The guests are, f- the guests are firmly secured to their seats with the multiple seat belts and as well as the chairs will rotate to give them a bird's eye view of the city. Well, it's, it's got a very mixed feedback because what if some uh, some are really really afraid of height, as some may not be able to digest the food properly? But then we can also thank to this local event organize, organizer, twenty twenty uh, two spicy entertainment. Kill um, it will be among the the first in Southeast Asia to experience these unique um, area dinners, and Kale will feature two sittings. A day, uh, which will be at 6.30 p.m. and also other one at 8.30 p.m. So there will be five course menu, which is dubbed modern European and also prepared by the Mark Fahey. He's a chef, uh, the cuisine in Hilton Kale's a Grace restaurant. And it takes approximately an hour to serve and also includes the option for vegetarians as well. So this experience is not cheap. Of course, let's talk about the price here. It's nearly 600-599 ringgit per person. And it costs way, way, way more than the meal at your average restaurant for sure. And these diners won't get a refund if the weather is bad. The dinner will be moved indoors. Still, seats were completely sold out within 48 hours. It's lunch, and as the company has added new time slots to keep up with the demand. So, if you really, really plan to book a place or ha- perhaps have a memorable or special moment with your partner or with your family but make sure to keep this in mind visit the restroom before you go up but then that will be the one of your uh, sort of lifetime experiences that you will enjoy and also be able to experience the whole uh, the new uh, feel of having dinners up in the air so uh, well especially the kale people look out and uh, you never know perhaps around uh, 6.30 to 8.30 uh, just go to kale tower and see what's up there and people are having dining <laughs> in the up air uh, well let's go to Indonesia uh, this Indonesia group uh, is very very famous uh, not only Indonesia but then also throughout Southeast Asia so uh, this singer uh, is uh, performing uh, promote this the culture there and uh, they are called the Cita Citata who is very widely known for uh, their debut uh, and it's also song title uh, Sakitnya uh, Dundisini and uh, this Zamora organized this festival with the cooperation and also the support of the uh, state government as well as tourism, culture and environment ministry 
and it will be held from June 13 until July 27, which is today. Well, they del- uh, deliberately invited uh, this uh, group, uh, who is very, very phenomenal when it comes to Indonesia music industry, and uh, to be part of this main uh, highlight of the this festival in Kudat, um, which is the charity concert. So. And tonight, especially from 7 to 11, the, the concert will be held. And they are very fully aware of this engaging famous Indonesian singer uh, for the, the concert will be very costly, but also they are considering this as the fast track to move to, I mean, so that uh, this Rungus culture and those customs will be better known in Asia and also hopefully globally. So for those who are uh, Indonesia, look out for this concert, perhaps uh, at least um have a look at or try to learn about this culture there and what's so special and perhaps spread this culture around the Southeast Asia. So that's it for our news commentary today, Monday. Well, uh, stay tuned for the next interview. But before that, uh, if you want to listen uh, to our podcast, uh, do look for it at YouTube. And we also have other social media, uh, media channels such as Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So your feedbacks are always welcome. But do not also forget to visit our website, durianasean.com. And also uh, have a look for more content at our website as well. So uh, we'll be back. Uh, and this is Grace signing off. <laughs>